all victims may not be innocent. Okay, so, you know, all like, look, black owned business in the black community, supportive of, you know, Black Lives Matter or, so, or, or not supportive of violence against the actual police. If their business is destroyed, I view that as a straight up innocent victim in this. But some businesses actually had their hand in the process. You know, there were some businesses that put up blue on um, that were their entire customer base are black people and they're not black and they're in the black community. So if your entire customer base are African-Americans and black people, and you know that there's a force that's out here oppressing them and abusing them, and in some cases killing them, they're harming your customer base, and you don't do any, you don't voice anything about that, and you may have taken it a step further by posting a Blue Lives Matter flag in your window. You, in that case, are not an innocent victim in this you know it means that you actually was part of the process which actually led to this which in my opinion means you don't have the moral authority to actually have a grievance in this actual process if black people are 100 percent of your customer base then that means you should have been taking action and at least voicing something about what had been going on to them before this actually happened but if you weren't uh Taking up, if I go into your store and I harass your customers in your store while they're there, you're going to get mad because I'm harassing your customers. Well, you can't be in, when I say blind support of the police in every single conflict there is, just blind support for them regardless of the facts, when you know that's what's harming your customer base. So if your business has been taken down, you're not an innocent victim. You're an African-American in the African-American community with the business and you actually was against a lot of this, then yeah, in my opinion, you are an actual innocent victim. Mm. Um, so I'm hoping that now um, people can, uh, I'm hoping that now more people can have more conversations about what kind of led up to this point, you know, and maybe we can actually get more people, there's more discussions about how everybody was ignored years ago and how there was pushback against it years ago, which built up into, you know, what we have now. I mean, you know, I can understand weighing each circumstance, but there were people that as soon as a conflict happened, they immediately took the side of the police right away, blindly took the side of the police. And there are some people that blindly took the side of the person that was shot, but I believe that's a human thing to do. When someone's murdered, it's a human thing to do to have compassion and empathy for that life and say that person should not have been killed. So it should be natural for someone to take that position regardless of the facts, then to immediately blindly take the side of the person who did the, the, the killing and just say, I'm just going to defend this person before any other facts are out. And that's what we were up against with Trayvon Martin. You had a, a, a complete ideological split of people just backing Zimmerman before they even had the facts. With Mike Brown, complete backing of the police officer immediately before you know all the facts was out, you know, and you know it's a it, it's a shame that with a George Floyd he had to be what I call the perfect victim, meaning that there wasn't a lot of things you could look into his background to try to justify why he was killed, but that's usually what happens. People look at the person that was killed. And they start looking to see if he dressed like a thug. You know, did he have, you know, did he have a hat on? You know, was he in a gang? And, you know, you know, what did he do? Oh, he was arrested for stealing potato chips six years ago. They would come up with all these rationalizations to try to say it was okay for that person to die. And then you look at George Floyd. Not only was that was probably the worst video I ever seen. So you get to see a man slowly die. But when you look into the guy's background, it was just, I mean, the guy... The guy was a, a pillar in his community. He, had so, he was such a positive figure. And it took away the usual red herrings that um, people who want to blindly support police normally come up with. So, um, you know, I just hope that, uh, you know, we can get, a, get away from this all lives matter, blue lives matter uh, pushback. And, you know, maybe next time someone kneels in the NFL, people would rather be quiet and let that type of lame protest actually go on, you know, and say, oh, shoot, but let that happen because you keep pushing back and trying to squelch it. It's like you're trying to provide cover for the injustice to continue.
if you fight the, if you go against the nonviolent direct action because you're trying to squelch its voice, it means you're, it, the un, the, whether it's an intended consequence or an unintended consequence based on your ignorance, you are providing cover for the actual injustice to continue. And as long as the people who engage in injustice see that society is split, if they know 50% of society is going to support them if they engage in the undarmed killing of a black person, it's not a deterrent for them to not do it in the future, as long as they know they have support. So hopefully now we can show them that you don't have the support of the community. You know, you don't have the support. I mean, hey, there's a few police chiefs that finally came out and said something, which normally they never do. They just be quiet. They, you know, they don't say anything. You know, you have the blue wall, the blue wall of silence, you know, among the police officers, which means that, you know, you just completely have to be quiet and take and protect the corrupt cop. And if you do speak out against corrupt cops, the entire police force, they won't aid you if you need help. And eventually they try to push you out. This is why people, some people say good cops don't last. You speak out against the bad cops, the force comes against you. And this is why people look at the entire institution as being guilty. It's because the cops who may not engage in direct violence against others were providing protection for the ones who actually did with that blue wall of silence. So that's how you get the sentiment that it's the institution and not a few bad apples. Because if you got a few bad apples being protected by the so-called good apples, then the entire bunch is actually rotten. So anyway, that's my thoughts on this, you know, so far for anybody who has any questions about it. Regretfully, the only thing we see so far is at the beginning, the sound is quiet. <laughs> but that's why I came closer. Oh, okay. Um, what, what does allyship or, or I've seen, I've seen in the anti-racist campaign that mm -hmm. better language is accomplice. Mm -hmm. What, what do you want for those of us of lighter skin to do, to say, to be in, um. in, um, Oh, you know, one thing I've been seeing this time is, which I may not have seen in, in other instances is, you know, um, I've been seeing some white people be more forceful with combating racism in all white spaces. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I have a, a, a couple of friends that are online and what they, I've seen them, you know, on their pages. Hi, sir. You know, all right. Okay, I get something on this side, okay. You know, so anyway, you know, when you're seeing um, what, what I'm seeing, you know, more, I've seen white folks that I didn't see before pushing back against family members, pushing back against friends, uh, pushing back when they actually see instances of racism, when normally they would, some of them may not have gotten involved in it, they may not have said anything about it, you know, because there's some people I've seen that send me messages, they're trying to combat uh you know racism in their spaces and some of them they know what's wrong but may not know how to engage in it so some of them send me messages and say hey look at this right here this is what i said you know and i'm like oh wow uh, and then sometimes i help and say okay look you know what you can point out to them so it may be some shadow shadow protesting going on there with that but um in challenging um you know, it, you know, it's just like it's like being a guy. You know, if you challenge misogyny and challenge patriarchy and challenge toxic masculinity when there's no women around, it won't get enough. It it won't have a breeding ground to practice because in order for these isms like racism to actually work, they have to have a place to practice at. You know, and if you don't give it safe haven to practice if they see that no matter where they go they're getting pushed back because a lot of those people probably aren't going to say anything in a black person's presence you know they do sometimes they do that does happen you know but in all white spaces when someone starts saying something that's somewhat racist or close to it i want you to think about this if they're saying it in front of you and not in front of me it's because they're assuming you're racist like they are that's the only reason why they're saying so you should immediately say I'm offended that you assume I'm racist because you said this in front of me you must think this is a safe space for you to be racist you assume I'm a racist I'm offended now because yeah. you assume I'm a racist so oh, one thing Ali Ship, yeah it's just you know in the spaces that we don't necessarily have that type of access to mm -hmm. it's the 
push back at all forms of it that you actually see within reason you know don't y'all be getting fired and losing your jobs and stuff i tell i there's some wife i have to tell i like okay look you about to be unemployed you you have to push back within means mm -hmm. you know because right now jobs are kind of hard to find right now you know because you know so don't just don't show up in a meeting and flip the table over you know what i mean you know you know there's some clever ways of actually you know yeah. saying certain things so like me i used to say when i used to encounter racism um, you know, sometimes there'd be white folks that think they'd be racist toward Mexicans because they figured, mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm black, maybe I'm racist toward Mexicans too. And I would either, sometimes I would lie and say that my wife was Mexican, I'm not married, or I would lie and say that, you know, my damn, you know, my father's actually Mexican, you know, I mean, I know he doesn't look like it. And it immediately throws them off because they think that, oh man, I have a serious they mean i have i have a bone I, I i have i i'm in the fight it's like oh shoot i just basically said something about mexicans and this dude's wife's mexican you could say the same thing hey you know my you know um you know hey you know my brother-in-law is black you know or this is bad. this is an easy way for people who don't really know how to handle those situations you could just really throw them off and make them really uncomfortable in in, in that instance so um looking at uh types of wording and messaging that people actually use that we know actually has the um you know that may be kind of like, like like using thug in reference to what's going on everyone knows there's a racial connotation to that mm -hmm. you know you can use thug in reference to whites hispanics and everybody but we all know what the most recent term meant you know and all because it isn't racist when you use it in other situations with other groups doesn't mean it's not racist here and let me give you how i explain that to people i was like i'm talking to a black guy over here and i tell him hey man you need he says something and i say you know what that's stupid man you need to get thrown in the gas chamber hardy har har black guy to black guy right okay now i go and say gas chamber to a jewish person you see how the same term, which didn't mean the same to the black person, means something totally different when I say it to the actual Jewish person because mm -hmm. of that history behind really? it. It's the same thing when you look at thug and some of these other words. Yeah, it has English language has many words that have so many meanings. Just look up a dictionary. Look up the word run. You know, the mm -hmm. word run got 20, 30 different meanings, right? Mm -hmm. We don't say it has to mean running down the street, you know. Mm -hmm. No, it must mean that, you know. And if I say, well, run also mean I went to the store. You know, I'm mean, gonna run to the store. You know, it didn't mean I physically ran to the store, right? Because you know, it has different definitions. Same thing with these, these, some of these dog whistle terms that you're actually hearing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, um, so yeah, um, you know, off the bat, that's what I'm thinking. Hey, not just push back in that, but you know, when you, and push back without, you know, necessarily having a black person seeing it. You know, I do appreciate it when I look on my timeline or if someone does a screenshot and shows me something that I can't see, you know, but um, it, 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 it does, it, it definitely does mean something to me personally when I've seen certain white folks just completely getting hammered by like, they're uh, just getting carpet bombed by a bunch of racist white family members and friends pushing back. And I look at that and say, holy shit, you know, I mean, Whatever support I can give emotionally to you all in those situations, because some of you all didn't realize just how racist your family was. You know what I mean? You know, some of y'all didn't find out till Trump got elected, and then you're like, "Holy shit!" You know, I knew I had racists in my family, but damn, they just they they just jumped out butt naked in front of everybody now. Yeah. You know, and that's a lot. That's that, that's a lot for someone to process. You know. What do you think about the idea that that? Um racism is isn't a rational fear mm -hmm. and we there's something to be said about if we treat it like a curable like like a, a mental illness mm -hmm. racism like a mental illness you know what that's actually interesting because let me tell you um i actually look at uh, i have like there's different types of racism that we look at you know yeah some people are racism due to lack of cultural diversity you know due to lack of like i say like for example let's say you have a black person they've only been around black folks some of them have some thoughts of white people because they're just never having any access to white people. The difference is they don't have the numbers of the power structure to take those beliefs and actually cause harm on white people. So that's why it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's racism with no teeth. You know, it's racism, you know, it's racism with dentures and someone pulls the dentures out and it has no bite, you know. But imagine it on the other end when you have people, so yeah, it can't, with people that have, um, it's like some people have bipolar in their family and becomes hereditary, you know, you're like, oh man, mm. this person has 
a history of mental illness in their family mm -hmm. or you can look at racism the same way hey listen did you grow up in some in this area in minnesota all white folks all upper class white folks that's all you had and did you come to chicago and only associate with upper class white folks okay now you've taken that cultural uh upbringing you had which was sheltered from any cultural diversity which means that any it, it means that there wasn't any white blood cells to attack the racism mm -hmm. that you may have actually encountered you know mm -hmm. so you end up there's people who are and, and these people are kind of like victims you know what i mean because they can't choose where they were born they can't choose the community that they, they grew up in um and they end up having these racist beliefs which ends up infecting their mindset you know throughout their life due to not having you know um access to people of other races you know i mean and do i mean imagine i mean i mean when i was real young we used to think all white people had money you know mm -hmm. and then when i finally started working with some white folks and i was valet parking i started finding out man there's a whole lot of poor white folks out here man they don't have shit you know i was like damn we were misled but then you look on tv all the white shows the tv the white folks had money in all the tv shows and we had a good time from poor black folks in the project you know, so we see that, and, and the thing was, I came from a middle class family. The black folks in my area actually kind of had a little bit of something, you know. But we knew that we saw, but we didn't see that representation on TV. This helps reinforce that psyche, you know. So if people, but one thing is, it's like one thing about the, uh, it being a mental illness is they say what is the morgy of people who are like psychotic. You know, I think I saw some stats. I think ninety four percent of people who have certain psycho mental disorders don't know that they actually have it. If you look at racism the same way, say, hey, this person has this illness, you don't know you have it. If we can get society to look at it that way, we can start treating it. You know, mm -hmm. say, okay, look, come in here. And the, oh, wait a minute. Oh, you believe this stereotype. You believe this. You believe this. You believe this. And then diagnose them that you have the sickness of racism. Right. And we can, it, 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 it can be fixed. It may be tough to actually fix it, you know, totally, but you can mitigate the damage of it. You know, we can get people to move from being maybe a David Duke to maybe an Archie Bunker. You know, I say there's different types of races. You know, like Archie Bunker, you know, he had a lot of racist beliefs, but if you notice, he never wanted to hurt a black person. And he didn't want to see harm happen to people, but he had terrible beliefs about them, right? I mean, it was just the ignorance of him was really bad, but he didn't want to actively hurt people. And he didn't like to see, you know, you see a certain episodes where he would get cornered and you would see he didn't want to see bad things happening to minorities and things mm -hmm. like that you know so if you, you know he now now his now if you see that this person has the type of breeding ground for that to become active racism you know i mean passive racism believing in these things active racism taking action based on those actual beliefs mm -hmm. so we can catch the people while they're passive racist we can probably move them away from potentially being radicalized into you know actionable racism and keep them over and ship them over, you know, to maybe, you know, hey, sometimes they they go from you know, being a, a full time, you know, you know, racist as far as in their beliefs to questioning them themselves. Like, oh man, wait a minute, is this racist? You know, once once you get people to acknowledge it, uh, or actually become aware that they could be participants in it, yeah. you know, and I think that's what has helped. Uh, explain you know it, it's i know it's this more so much more difficult with white folks especially white men you know because they're like the top of the food chain you know what i mean as far as you know if, you, if there was an oppression ladder you know this one group is way up here there's really not much oppression going on with them you know but when you have some black folks that understand oppression but they may not understand sexism you know what i mean they may not understand homophobia you know but they understand oppression toward blacks it's easier to sometimes explain to them how some of the same uh, pillars of one type of oppression is also in these other types. So it becomes yeah. easier for them to actually understand and then become cured from those other isms that they actually had. Yeah. You know, it was like me when I was young, you know, uh, you know, we were raised with homophobia. The whole community was raised with it, you know. Yeah. And meanwhile, we didn't realize that we had a flaming gay friend the whole time. Yeah. This guy named Nelson, man. Flaming gay was all our friends. We all knew he was gay. If you mess with Nelson, we'd kick your ass. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Meanwhile, we didn't give a damn about any other gay people. The hell with them. You know, we didn't yeah. care about them. We, we didn't like gay people, but we liked Nelson. Mm. Now, 
in hindsight, I look back at that and I say, how many white people realize that I can have a black friend, make an exception to that, I call it exception to the rule racism, you yeah. know, oh, wait a minute, I got a black boyfriend, you know, I have black friends, but I think the whole rest of them ain't worth shit, you know what I mean? You know, like I saw the bird watcher lady, you know, I, I bet you she's dated black guys in the past. A hundred dollars, she's had a black boyfriend or something in the past. But yet that had nothing to do with how she viewed the race as a whole or leveraging that racism. Mm -hmm. So, um, seeing, so yeah, is it, you know, I, I, that's why some people I look at them and based on where they come from, I just look and say, you know, uh, they're, you know, victims of their cultural background. I mean, just like I'm, I can be, you know, just like, you know, hundreds of years of oppression and racism has, uh, um, has an impact, you know, in our communities that may make it harder for us to overcome. You know, you have to look at racism the same way. You have hundreds of years of systemic racism being fed through family members and friends, even in passive ways, you know, that, you know, it, it's going to take, um, that stuff ends up, it ends up becoming something that they're impacted by. And I think that's why it should be, yeah, it could be looked at as a, you know, a, a mental illness because it's, um, especially the different degrees of it. You know, it's like you have functional bipolar people and then you have people who are, you know, not quite so functional in society. You right. know? So you have people who have racial beliefs of black people, but they can, you know, date one, they can hang with them, they can work with them fine, yeah. you know. Then you have the other ones who don't even want you touching their hand. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You know, and then they get to the point to where if it's easier for them to springboard into, you know, getting involved with actual violence racism. You yeah. Know? So, you know, yes, oh yes, I could agree with that. <laughs> um, one of the things that's been coming up is actually like if we statistically look, and you and I have mm -hmm. talked about this, of, of like, um, lonely white males you had mentioned before like are in the mm -hmm. oppressor category mm -hmm. and also when they when they're profiled as supposed to be very high achieving but like mm -hmm. they live in their basement right in their mom's house and they've never dated mm -hmm. you know um there seems to be some correlation between really violent mm -hmm. uh intentions and an execution of those like literal execution yeah. like sandy hook like mm -hmm. all of our mass shootings are Right, like are essentially, yeah, yeah. are essentially mm -hmm. by the white male profile that we mm -hmm. we thought were going to be our high achievers based on how many advantages have happened mm -hmm. in that direction. Mm -hmm. And so I have curiosity about what you would speak to um, regarding. Uh, I guess I guess sort of like white guilt, white fragility, but like mm -hmm. what about um, more pointedly, I guess I'm pointing to to the Blue Lives Matter campaign mm -hmm. and how there's nuance about how probably, you know, somebody who, who's, com who's comfortable to do what happened to George Floyd mm -hmm. is a very, like, mentally ill person. Mm -hmm. You know, that you could comfortably, with, without really much thought, do that, mm -hmm. as it appeared in the video. I mean, that was, mm -hmm. that's what I took away. Um, well, it, it, you know, I don't know if... Um, well, with 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 that guy in particular, um, he with there's been well, well 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 okay bridging the gap trying to bridge the gap between what he did and what some of the it's, it's a little different because some of those the, the lonely white male syndrome if we call it or whatever you know some of them it's because um, they still have this uh, nostalgic belief that's been handed down to them as um, women somewhat being uh, property and women being a reward for mm. their actual achievements in life. You know? mm -hmm. So if you look at mirror earlier, early 1900s, you know, 1800s, where, when women just didn't have that much opportunity, the best thing you could do was marry a guy that had the act, that had it, right? You know, the family, the family would look into the guy, make sure he had money, make sure he had land. If everyone needed to, they would aggregate money and give to the guy, not the woman, right? Yeah. You give to the guy so he can take care of this lady, you know? And then if he dies or something, what does she do? She look for another guy to come in there, right? It's really not a lot of work to yeah. find a mate if you were a guy under those things. You didn't have to wine and dine and, 
put in the work and learning how to treat them and talk. You didn't have to do all that, mm -hmm. right? It was, hey, listen, I'm a guy. I got money. You don't have access to it. You know, yeah. you need to be with me. Oh, wait a minute. So if I could just strangle things economically for you and make it to where your only relief is going to me, these people have a nostalgic for that. Mm -hmm. And because I, I, you know, I, I've been on the men rights forums and this, they believe that um, a lot of the, the things that have contributed to women's independence in society, that the adverse effect of that was them having not having access to companionship. Yeah, you know, sure. and you know, but it's yeah, it's, it's, there is there is some truth to that. It's because yeah. they want things. They don't want to work for anything. They want women to desperately need them. You know, to okay, you have to be with me because you have no choice. You know, so those men end up believing that society is rigging the game against them. And you got to look, they're white men of privilege. A lot of them have a lot of, I mean, I mean, how, how many of them came from lower, really, really poor, lower economic class? Most of those actual guys, the incel guys that started shooting and taking arms, mm -hmm. you know, because they're angry. Well, incel means involuntary celibate, you know, mm -hmm. it was a really bizarre concept. Yeah. Uh, but there was other things I saw that were called the same thing some years ago when I used to, I, you know, used to research a lot of those crazy guys. And um, so, there, you know, I don't know if, I, I guess, I guess if, I guess the type of, there may be a chemical imbalance that m makes it easier for them to accept the conspiracy theory that the society is rigging things against them. Yeah. With what? But yeah. when it comes to, well, uh, one of the reasons why you don't see us black guys out here, you know, um, I mean, there have been some black serial killers. There have been black uh, mass shooters. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you had the DC sniper. You know, there are some circumstances where there were some black guys, but you weren't finding black men that started killing people in society because they were angry that they couldn't get a girlfriend or a wife. You know, sure. we, we don't have we. we um, a lot of us were dealing with the constant oppression of society in general and overcoming that to you know whether we're some of us have gotten into middle class upper middle class and the entire time we're still under the gun in many other types of ways you know so we never saw uh, the entire time we never a lot of us didn't see that we had we never had the position historically to feel that all women in society uh, we had a right to our pick of whichever one we wanted without any work or circumstance because us and, you know, black women were, you know, both didn't really have much, you know, and yeah. we, were, we were constantly fighting society. And then if a white woman was gonna try to date you and you were black, especially 60s, 50s and 40s, that was her just willing to take on all kinds of them, uh, just just a whole host of not craziness, you know what I yeah. mean? You know, so the strength to have to deal with that. And this is something the white guy doesn't have that historical, you know, they, don't, they, they, they didn't have to deal with that as an actual um, group, you know, mm -hmm. and this is why you don't have us man going around shooting people because we were used to finding ways to, you know, like a peacock, you know what I mean? We want to wave our feathers to attract women, you know, we had all kinds of other ways of trying to attract them. You know, like it was a guy I used to, uh, I, I tell you a story, there was, there was this guy that, uh, that was in the, his name was Gerald and he told me, um, he told me, hey, listen, I could be in a wheelchair and on cut crutches. He said, I'm still going to always have women today, you know, because he didn't view any circumstance in his life preventing him from being able to find women That's today, yeah, you know. Yeah. And these guys, they look at the whole system being rigged against them, you know, yeah. which if you think about it, there is there is some rationale to that. You know, yeah. it's like, OK, I don't have a, a you know, th this rite of passage, you know, so I, I don't have that, you know, I mean, you know, so. so I think maybe mm -hmm. that's the piece that I'm connecting to of like, um, even though there should be every affirmation that you're in the position of power, you've mm -hmm. got the badge that, you know, like in terms of policemen and making that yeah. connection, the authority mm -hmm. of, um, and still that must, there must be something broken psychologically mm -hmm. to still feel a threat when you have every accoutrement right. to make it clear that you are safe mm -hmm. and this unarmed civilian is not. Mm -hmm. And yet you're going through these extremes as though as though you are at risk mm -hmm. you know so that's i i feel like they're that's the connection that i kind of want to make of mm -hmm. the illusion of 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 um the fear of yeah. well here it is um 
some of that may not actually be the actual police officer's fault. It could be white society fault in general. So just think about this. Um, police officers are basically just men that are pulled from the society, just like a jury. You know, when you stop pulling people for a jury, their entire mindset of what they have for society comes with them. And black people are feared. We are seeing, people think we're just a walking constant threat at all times, mm -hmm. you know? So if there's civilians that believe this and think this, and if you hire that civilian to end up being a cop, now he encounters a black guy, it's the exact same thing. When you see a white person that, you know, black guy going to his house and trying to go in and white people see it and get scared, don't realize he lives there, they call the police. That's, that's that fear that they have because mm -hmm. they see a black person. Well, that person becomes a cop. And now they have the, they've got firepower and they have society backing them. So now that fear that's been instilled in them throughout the generations of black skin, they now can actually react toward it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, I was telling somebody how, like when I'm going shopping, it was, uh, it, it's just second nature to me. If I'm shopping, there's a white lady, you know, and normally it's in the suburb, you know, but white lady going to her car, if my car is in that same direction that her car is going in, I'll stand by the curb and I'll wait until she gets all the way to her car because I don't want to go to my car with my groceries too close to her going to get her groceries, you know, because she may think something. And certain men too, I'll look at some white guys and I'll look at them and say, okay, that white guy look like he ain't scared of me if something happens. You know, and I'll look at one white guy and say, I think I better wait right here. That guy sees me too close to him. He might freak out and call the police, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And say, oh man, this guy's, you know, I'm scared or I think I saw something, you know? Um, I mean, look at, I give an example of the show, What Would You Do? On ABC, What Would You Do? Where they took a, a situation where they had white people, white boys tearing up a car in the forest preserve. And there was black guys, they had tear up a car in the forest preserve. The black folks tearing up a car in the forest preserve got all, a bunch of phone calls to the police department with people standing around right in front of them calling the police. When the white people, white guys are uh, tearing up a car, there was two calls to the police department. One was from somebody who saw it. The other call to the police department was people who saw a black kids in the car sleep in the parking lot, not that far from the car being destroyed by the white guys. And that means someone literally looked and saw white folks engaging in a crime and felt the threat was the black folks sleep in the car. And the black folks sleep in the car, know who they were. They were the actors that were paid by ABC to conduct the next, you know, the, the car destruction, you know, social experiment. That just shows you the fear that black people have, that white people have, in generality, that we are a constant threat, you know. And they don't know how to assess which one of us, you know, you know, like, like somebody walking down the street at night, you know, how to assess what's a threat and what's just a black guy. You know what I mean? You know, cause, yeah, cause just like, you know, a woman's walking home, you know, almost all men are a threat. You know what I mean? If she's drunk coming from a bar or something like that. At that point, everybody's a potential threat. You know, but how to look at some people, a lot of white folks, they don't know how to look at certain black people and say, hey, this person looks like I should be on my P's and Q's. This person is completely fine, you know, but still don't react and just think that, oh, he might be a threat. Let me, you know, act on so um, I think that is what ends up being on our jury because people have that mindset and then mm -hmm. now you're in the jury and you're thinking, wait a minute, this is how I feel about black people. You know what I mean? I'm scared of them. If I was a cop, what would I do in that situation? Would I shoot? I'm scared of black people too. So then they get to relate with the officer, mm -hmm. I think. And this is how you get those juries. They get screwed up. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, hung juries or you look, you look, they're deliberating forever. You know, I mean, you look at Zimmerman, you know, how many white people would have been just as scared of Trayvon watching him walk. And they probably looked at Zimmerman as brave for being to confront what they think is their fear because they fear it as well. So I don't know if, I know that the sense of power with being a police officer coupled with people's pre-existing fear of black skin actually worked. I'm gonna tell you another life, an example of how, I'll tell you an example of when I was able to use that fear to actually help somebody. I'm in a bar white guy being really abusive to his girlfriend in the bar poking her in the head talking i saw four or five white guys try to stop this dude from harassing this woman right they're trying to stop and they're all around the table he's not paying them no attention and this was in glenview some years ago and i'm sitting here like man 
what should I do? You know, black dude get up and say something in front of the And finally, I had had enough with this guy, right? When I got up and I went over to that guy, I said, dude, cut this shit out. And I talked to the lady, I said, are you trying to leave, ma'am? And she was like, yeah. I said, walk out the door. She got up and walked out and he looked at me in fear. So you had five white guys that tried to get this dude to stop being abusive to the white woman. One black guy said something, and plus the guy was bigger than me. So you can't say he was a, he was bigger than me, you know? And so just think about that. That was that black fear. Just me walking over there and saying that scared the shit out of him. The lady was able to exit. Okay, now think about that same guy's fear if he's a police officer and he pulls me over. He has that fear still, but he has the authority now. And I, I this is the, um, the type of mindset. I mean, let's look, there's been black guys that have been caught carrying gun in stores and people would attack them because they think it's a threat. And he's in an open carry state, open carrying like everybody else. You know, there's been stats that show that when people do target practice, they're, they're more jumpy to shoot the black targets than the actual white targets. So there's a societal programming, you know, which make, you know, that happens that I think is what is that connection when you get that white cop, you know, in that black guy situation, you know, that's those societal beliefs that just come with them into the actual job. And then the type of job just makes it worse. I just want you to know, Brian Conley says great points. Oh, thank you, oh, Brian. <laughs> and, um, I mean, you know, um, yeah, I, I, you know, so I was thinking, you, you know, the type of, uh, the type of things that also happen is trying to recognize when people are rationalizing, because sometimes I find, I call it people, it's, it's a, um, I mean, it's probably a whole nother conversation. I'll probably have another day, but I've, I've, I've worked, I do a lot of work on what they call competitive intelligence, you know, where, where I help get information from certain corporate competitors for other, you know, for a client that I'm working for or something like that. As the cover, you know, so if the, by you letting white people think that I'm not smart enough, to be someone that's probably trying to gather information because they see that as something sophisticated, you know, like hacking, you know, or intelligence that people do. They, they, they don't think a black person could be doing that. And especially if you're a black person with broken English and broken grammar, you know, so sometimes I have to lay it on thick, you know, I really talk stupid, you know, so I just go completely under the radar, you know, and then they don't think it, you know, sometimes if I can't do it. I can coach some other black person who may be at the company and tell them, hey, listen, it doesn't matter your background, your degrees, your PhDs, you're black. You can always turn on the stupidity uh, trigger on them. You know, as soon as they think that, then when someone finds out that information has been getting out of the company, they never think it's you. Even though you more qualified to have been doing it than the other white people there, if you trigger that, then that's, as long as you trigger that, you can go completely under the radar. I've organized entire campaigns where I was in a company and people all assumed it had to be somebody white that was involved when they found out something was going on and they didn't find out it was me until all the damage had been done already and it was too late because they don't think I'm capable of actually doing that and I think that assuming that we are less intelligent and you know less intelligent also is a connection to like a Neanderthal type of thinking you know if you're dumb then um, like how, how many how many sophisticated educated people are people afraid of physically you know you people think that oh you're educated you're smart then the last thing they need to think about is you being a potential threat <laughs> physically oh mm -hmm. undereducated this guy's not that smart that means he's probably more likely to resort to physical violence mm. he's more likely to be a threat mm -hmm. you know but in those circumstances, as long as I don't turn it up too much, but if I can invoke that with people, they think I'm not, so they're, they may be afraid of me physically, but they don't think intellectually I'm capable of getting information, you know? And they'll mm -hmm. look and turn over the rock of every white person in that company and pay me absolutely no attention. Mm -hmm. And then even when everything's pointing up, but it's the same thing, it's a type of racism. Mm -hmm. 
the day the day that we can work to where I'm not successful at doing that anymore, mm -hmm. you know, we're probably gonna have less shootings too. Yeah. You know, because then people you look at black folks and you know, I mean, and you're not gonna people start looking at them as people. And also being able to accurately uh, judge um the so the intellectual sophistication of someone. You know, I mean when we saw that bird watcher, that guy was textbook guy that should never have been assumed that that shit that she was going to pull was going to work but guess what she just saw black skin and said oh it'll work that's all she looked at his demeanor appearance none of that fit the profile the stereotypical profile but no she saw black skin that'll work so that's that um uh yeah so that type of way of thinking as long as I can do that and as long as those people think that way I think some of those fears are going to carry over into people who hire people people on the police department and being on a jury it's just that the way they execute those prejudices they have is different in all of those circumstances and in, in the case of police you have trigger happy pull the gun real quick thing I don't know why they just think all of us are suicidal and homicidal at the same time, right? It's like you pull me over and you think I'm just willing to jump out and just. I mean, how many of us are. You know what I mean? You, I mean, they, people will hear that an unarmed black person gets shot and everyone thinks that we're all of us are just homicidal and suicidal. We're all walking threats, willing to get killed, you know? Yeah, yeah you know, I mean, the fact that it, as long as people keep thinking that that were a threat I think that's what's carrying over into these other things in which it's just that the way it manifests as a police officer you know white person out of business won't hire me you know or not me I'm not saying me particularly you know I, I have no ways around that but they have they'll uh they'll say oh, we're not gonna hire that guy you know we're gonna hire this person this person is gonna scare them because they're black you know that same person the police officer is trigger happy because of the actual threat you know that person's on the jury no matter what evidence you submit on that in that damn case they're still thinking black person had to be in the wrong you know had to be in the wrong regardless of what evidence they actually see so um how to get people to actually see the value in all of us in you know not being a threat and some of that is not even their fault totally either because if you look in the media and you see violence committed in a black community being elevated way more than anything else then that's going to help create that psyche psychosis in the, in people's mind to believe that this is what they are you know i've met people in other countries they're subjected to that type of media and then they think that we're all you know violent too because this is what they actually see you know you know if they more people were taught in statistics critical thinking analytical thinking i think that would help in their thinking process so they won't make these type of illusory correlations all the time you know mm -hmm. always correlating black with violence you know black with being a threat they keep making this connection mm -hmm. and then that's what's manifesting i think in a lot of these you know police shootings you know and and not not saying that there are some just flat out racist white supremacist types that are like you know they just have their fuel with hate that could be on the police you know that's different than i'm saying per se the the other ones you know who mm -hmm. are it's a different type of racism that a lot of people in society share but even some black folks have you know there was a guy that went around asking black people in the black community a bunch of false stereotypes of black people and a lot of black people were getting it wrong so some of them are even subjected to it Mm -hmm. You know, I've walked and talked to black folks in certain neighborhoods and they think everyone's poor and I'm pointing at them. I'm like, look at all these cars in front of these houses. I said, are you paying attention? I'm like, everyone on your block is making 50 to 70 grand a year. And yeah. you don't even, you live right in the community and you don't see it because the black person themselves is even being brainwashed into thinking that their value is decreased. Even though, you know, right, I just, you can go to Inglewood, go to Inglewood between business hours and see how there's fewer cars on the street. Obviously, some people are going to work, you know. Yeah. So yeah, so um, so it's not. Ne it may not necessarily be there. Um, there could be some of it is ignorance, lack of critical thinking, and a victim of what they actually see, and lack of cultural diversity. It's like an entire equation.
Anything else? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> you tell me. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I, mean, I wasn't prepared totally for this. You know? Really, I, mean, I think you've been preparing your entire life yeah. to speak like the the <laughs> voice of reason and logic <laughs> about some very hard subjects. And uh, we have somebody who says, "Can I share?" What do you say to them? Yeah, go ahead, share wherever you. It doesn't okay. matter. Share it all over. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's what I said. I said yes all over, and then I thought it was bad grammar. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Is it? So, I, yes all over. <laughs> Yeah, it depends I on who says comma, it. Right? Yes. Yeah. All if over. you say it, it's not bad grammar. <laughs> if it's me, I need to make sure that comma is there and the punctuation is accurate, or it's gonna be viewed as bad grammar. With you, it's just oh, just fat fingers typo. With me, I'm a dumbass. Hmm. You know, so I, I, I'd have to, I'd be definitely looking at the spell <laughs> check. You know? I think we have lots of evidence to the contrary of that theory. <laughs> We've collected a lot of data mm -hmm. um, that that we can. You know, just just by sheer eloquence and and length and um, multiple multiple great points, as Brian said, you're not a dumbass. <laughs> Some people would think that regardless, though. Well, here's know. the thing. Well, I do want to cycle back what mm -hmm. you had mentioned about like um, we have a lot of behavioral attributes to intelligence level, mm -hmm. and I feel like. Um, it is true that, that it behooves us to sort of imagine that there are a, like a lot of different things that people could be intelligent at. Mm -hmm. And some people are way better at being like survivor. Yeah. And some people are way better at, at, at being, um, you know, like philosophers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can have any combination thereof and your life circumstance can, can help you practice those skills. So I just yeah. wanted to say that like, if anybody is, you know, in a similar place of being concerned about family members that are presenting as racist mm -hmm. at this time, to mm -hmm. imagine that's not a life sentence. Right. Nor, nor even if, if you have family members that are, you know, hit, beat in the streets or, mm -hmm. I, you know, like doing things that are nefarious at that time. It's like, mm -hmm. just because you were something at one point in your life, that's the beauty of, of the opportunity and the challenge of the human existence is that there's change. Change mm -hmm. is like the one thing we can all kind of guarantee. Yeah. Um, and, and the opposite of change would be like just done, mm -hmm. done. It's the cat, it, it, a, a lot, uh, I, I wonder what type of things trigger that. You know, I've met like people who were, you know, like uh, that were like Dick Cheney, for example, the homophobe most of his life, daughter comes out as gay, all of a sudden he's not a homophobe anymore, you know? So, I mean, I hope that we don't have to have that. It doesn't take that type of change for some people. Because there's just not enough of us black folk to go around, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I mean we can't. I mean, we couldn't. Ma we couldn't even have. We couldn't marry. You know, black person couldn't marry eight white people. It wouldn't be enough of us to actually have that type of force to actually just by sheer association of marriage, yeah. you know, or a friend or somebody dating. You know, I mean, you know, I, I hope that that. But some people, it seems that seems to be what it takes. You know, I've seen people where someone dates a black person and brings them home to the family, and that's when the entire process of trying to learn about black people began. I mean, I know, I, I guess it's never too late, but oh boy, if you're like 57, 58, and you're just not getting around to that, it, you know, it could be a very steep hill to climb, you know? I mean, I see where, you know, they have, um, you know, I, I know I, I have to commend, I would say this, I have to commend some of the white folks out here who have met someone of color, dated them, and the entire full force of racism from their social friends, family, and everything came upon them about that. And make no mistake, it's very clever sometimes, you know. People know they can't just say, oh, he's black, you know what I mean? So they're racist but smart enough to rationalize it. You know, where they'll find every other thing negative and kind of use what I call a blowfish, the blowfish fallacy. You know, you find something small and blow it up. So they take all these other little things and say, oh, you shouldn't be with that person for these reasons. You know, when actually the, it's, it's because they they look at uh, some, some people look at a black person as trouble. And then you have some people look at us as like stock value, meaning that no matter how good we are, we're, we're just a good running Chevy, you know, and the white folks are the Ferraris. Right. You know, so I can, you know, even though, even, oh man, you're, oh man, you're a black guy, you earn a hundred grand, oh, well, you're a Corvette, you know, you still ain't a Ferrari, mm -hmm. you know, and there's some people that look at, and I've seen some people, their families, they would say they're dating this black person, 
and the entire full-fledged force of racism from their friends and family show up to try to condemn that relationship and every other excuse or reason they can come up with but it's but without actually saying the race and i know i'm, I'm sure a lot of people can't take that and they just back out and just go back to Jaden to make sure they only date white folks because they can't handle that type of pressure. And I've seen some people just straight up reject their entire families and everything. They just they just go off about their life and say, okay, this is what I who I'm in love with, and disassociate from their family, their friends, and everything because they're basically rejecting all of that racism that came from them and how them people are judging them to just be who they wanted to be with. And I have to say, for the people that uh, that have to that have to deal and put up with that, you know, hey, hey, I got I got to commend you. You know, it's nice to have the privilege to reject your entire eco structure because a lot of us, our survival mechanism is that. You know, I mean, you know, I know someone that can fix a car. You know, I I got people I haven't talked to in a year. I can call them at two in the morning. They're gonna come out and help me. I'm gonna help them. You know, uh, you know, so I couldn't imagine just rejecting all of that for somebody, you know, but luckily I would say that a lot of us don't have that to overcome as much as white folks that decide to buck their culture and their circumstances to be with somebody who, you know, they view as a Chevy. <laughs> it's like, why are you bringing a Chevy? Why are you bringing a Chevy Caprice to the Le Mans race? You're supposed to show up in a Ferrari or a Lamborghini at that, you know? Why are you showing up with that? You know, you showed up with this Chevy, you know? And then no matter how much you argue how that Chevy is a better quality than that Ferrari and Lamborghini, the only thing they look at is, you know what? It's good quality, but it's still a Chevy. <laughs> the hell you doing with a damn Chevy, you know? When you bring that Chevy around family and friends, they ain't never gonna accept that Chevy. You need to go get that damn Lamborghini and that damn Ferrari. That's what you need to be doing. <laughs> That feels like a wrap. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Anything you want to say to the good people <laughs> of the world? That's it. You know, uh, that's... Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe you know, I never did this before. Maybe one day I'll put together a whole thing about, you know, outsmarting racism as a competitive intelligence professional. Mm. You know, I used to keep this stuff proprietary because all of us are competitive that do this. Because now a lot of us that do it. But um, I've come to the conclusion that I could educate everybody about the racism that I use against them and it will still work anyway, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, maybe talk about, hey, listen, you know, this is how we've got African-American hackers getting all in your business and getting all kinds of information outside of your company. And they're getting all this shit because you're too racist to see the black person was a damn threat. And we got, we got some of us making a lot of money doing this type of work, you know, because mm. we know how to use racism to our advantage, <laughs> you know? So, so I, and I you know I asked my, this one guy who first, um, this PI that brought me into that world of many years, his name was uh, Sam McNeil, Sam McNeil Research that I first worked for. And I asked him, I was like, you realize that racism is gone, we're out of, we might be out of fucking work? <laughs> I said, white folks ain't stupid no more, how can we fool them to get all in their business and get their shit? You know, I was like, don't we need a little bit of racism to kind of stay here for us to stay at work? Because the people that hire us, hire us for these niche situations where they figure a black person can get under the radar and get all the stuff for their business or for their clients and stuff like that. So I'm like, you know, we're out here rah, rah in racism. I'm like, do you realize that this work might be putting our own selves out of business? You know, I mean, you know, I, I was, you know, that one railroad campaign that I had organized, you know, those damn people, they thought, they kept thinking there was two white guys that were involved the whole time. You know, I was getting stuff out the trash, out the computer systems. We were getting all this stuff and the whole time they kept looking at the two white guys. And them white guys, them poor guys, they really had nothing to do with this shit. You know, and that's because it was like all Hispanic people, two black guys, no, it was all Hispanic people, two white guys, and the black guy. And they just figured it had to be one of the two white guys that was causing all this pain and grief that was happening to him. And I look at that and say, damn, if racism's gone. That shit won't work that well anymore. So let's, I want to just back up because I know the story a little bit more, but you were essentially like helping the railroad union by way of... We of... put a union in there. Okay. Yeah. So I actually went and um, I had gotten to this company and, uh, and I actually started, I was working there. 
and they didn't have a union and there was sexism racism there was so many problems there that there's a lot of sexism and racism that i normally put up with in places that i work at you know you used to have this expression under some activists you don't shit where you sleep because you know hey you raise hell for injustice everywhere but if you do if you literally do it everywhere you may not have a job yeah. you know so in some case you're like okay there's a certain level of racism i could put up with a certain level of sexism it's like a woman who put up with some sexism but you smack her on the ass she'd be like okay i'm willing to lose my job for this shit. you know what i mean yeah. there's a line yeah you know there's certain things so i put up with certain things there and then eventually when i decided to um kind of use some of the skills that i had and start really digging into the company you know really really deep and start re uh, organizing the workers to actually form their own union uh, to try to address some of the, the things that they were actually coming up against. So that, that entire process, that whole organizing process that was happening, you know, the company hired investigators and lawyers and completely focused them on the two white guys the whole time. And mm -hmm. one white guy that, that was on our side when we was having our individual meetings, he knew that he was, a, he was taking the heat. You know, and he was like, dude, they're thinking me and this guy, Scott. And he was like, man, I don't mind taking the heat if you can just keep going, you know. And I was like, good, you know, hey, as long as they keep thinking you're involved in this, they're never going to look at me. They didn't know it was me until there was a television interview that I was in. And at this point, it was a strike. And 95% of the company wasn't at work and they was out on the picket line, you know. And then that's when they actually found out, you know. And even even with all the, when we started negotiating for a contract, you know, it was me, but they didn't think it was me that was writing the language. They didn't think it was me that had the bargaining strategy. They thought it had to be somebody else behind the scenes. And when they did finally find out that it, you know, it was me, um, you know, they did finally, you know, it, 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 you could tell it was something that they just could not accept at all. Like, there's, there's no way we can believe that this is what is happening. But I've seen it in other you know, I said I've 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 seen, I've I've seen that situation many times, and it's something I live for. You know, if I can outsmart people's racism, I live for when it hits them that they've been outsmarted because of their racism. You know, I, I live for when that aha moment hits them, and they go, "Oh shoot, it was the black guy all the time." It may not be me. Sometimes I'll help another black person that's mm -hmm. in a company or something. Or if we're going to send a black person into a situation. You know, and we figured out their right to take advantage of the racism of white people to kind of, you know, do certain things. Now imagine if white folks looked at people, was able to assess the capabilities and the intellect of black people properly, then they would see some of us just as threats mm -hmm. as the white guys are. You mm -hmm. know, I've seen black folks with I, that have a background in IT and a white dude with a damn, not even a high school education. They looking over here and I'm like, the IT guy. That's the hacker. You hired him as an IT guy. And yet this guy is constantly USB porting in different computers and snatching shit off. And it's like, you're still looking at the white guy. I've seen some amazing racism just completely let people off the hook. I've seen it where people, I've even seen it where in retail theft, you know, where there was teams of people that would go into a Walmart and while the cameras were looking at the black folks, the white people stole everything. And this was the, this was the theft. The, the black folks and whites were in on it together. Hey, we're going here. They're going to follow you all around the store and we'll steal everything. And there's people that have done that for years. Never got caught. I mean, go in the store with a, I mean, taking, I saw look, someone literally took the, a stroller as a floor model, cut the thing, loaded it with stolen shit. White person and pushed it out the store because people were looking at the black people, you know? And, and you know, uh, you know, I, I saw what people were doing. Uh, I saw an entire credit card fraud at a Sam Club happen. And what was funny about it was the actual people who were actually, when it came to people putting something in their pocket, they were always searching the black folks, right? But these black, some black folks actually got together and pulled like a really sophisticated credit card fraud. And they did it while investigators kept coming to the place investigating. Because they kept investigating the white people. Mm. And I'm sitting here like, these people, there's people that have computer backgrounds working in the membership office. It's mm. like, 
that's the, they're the, you know, I knew them, so I wasn't going to say anything. I'm sitting here like, I can't believe it. They're bringing people from out of state to investigate, and they never interviewed the black people. They just kept going at the white people, thinking it had to be them that were doing that. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and said, damn, wouldn't it be nice for us to be assumed of being criminals <laughs> like this too? How come we can't be considered criminals of, ha of sophisticated crimes? Right. You know well, what I, mean? I want to have the caliber of a white collar crime. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, it's like, man, this is groundbreaking. You know, if we could get black folks to start being the suspect, you know, I mean, if they would have interviewed me, I probably would have been crying. Like, this is great, this is racial progress. They interviewed me Equality. to see. Yeah, they interviewed a black person to see. Cause what they were doing was they were making their own credit cards with uh -huh. the pictures of themselves on it. Uh -huh. And they were not in the system. So when they went to charge things in different stores, it was to corporate accounts. Oh, wow. So when you looked at a credit card, you saw the picture, let's say me for example, you see me on the picture and the name is John Arbuckle or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, So if I go to charge something, all you do is you look at the picture, you say, okay, it has to be me because I'm on the picture. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, was, it, it was an entire black operation and they, and it got, they got close to getting caught, but there, only one person actually had got caught in that whole thing, you know? And that's because he got kind of, you know, got kind of silly. But the thing was, they did that shit for two and a half years. Mm. with constant investigation pressure the whole time mm. and just think about you know how bold you got to be to know that people are going to investigate this and i'm going to keep doing it anyway because i know you're never going to look at me mm. you know so that's uh you know so i guess the day that you know when they investigate and they actually interview the blacks and white folks too then you know and after, we in trouble then you know, now they suspect us you know, so now we can't even engage in white collar crime anymore because racism has taken a big hit. And now they're actually looking at us too, like they're looking at y'all. Am I gonna need to edit this out? <laughs> Do you feel like it's just bad press right now? I don't know. I, hopefully it's a little silliness at the end. This yeah, is, I don't know. but this is the equality that we want, you know? Like I, remember, I saw when Obama, people saying that Obama was a snob. I was like, this is probably, you know, a black guy considered you know, upper class elitist? Yeah. I'm like, shit, this is great. Yeah. You know, I was like, damn. I'm like, I'm proud of that. Yeah. You know, I'm like, we got snobs and upper class and high saluting people that, that look down on people with pompous <laughs> eyes too. You know, how can we don't ever get accused of being the silk stock and gray poupon society folks, you know? How can we can't, you know? I mean, we, we, you know, what, what the hell? You know, uh, cause I have, I heard from I heard from some guys that actually had um uh, one time I had some complaints among some people in the um should I say in the in the should I say the the um competitive intelligence you know community and certain aspects you know I was like you know you start to, some people if they weren't used if they didn't directly experience the way I work they would have doubts about anything I put together any kind of report the entire time I didn't see that with whites. And I used to think that it was because of my background. And then I finally started meeting people from DC that were black people with PhDs. And they told me that the reason why we all start our own consulting businesses and the reason why you don't see a lot of black CEOs is because people, even though we're squeaky clean, never been arrested and we have PhDs, people still doubt our work anyway. So much that we would rather just, you know, um, we would rather just become a um that they doubt their work so much that they would rather just become their own consulting firm on the mm -hmm. side and not work up to be a ceo so basically it was a couple of guys tell her trying to let me know that don't think because you don't have a phd like us that, that don't think that getting that will free you from that type of criticism or that type of you know people denying of your capable doubting your capabilities because look at our background we go through the exact same thing so that's just the nature of it don't think you need to do all of this to get out of that because once that's something i would be thinking like you know i'm i'm rolling with the big dogs but i don't have the pedigree you know for it you I, know um if you if we were to give you an honorary mm -hmm. phd in something what would you be your, <laughs> what would be your pick wow That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know because I recognize my own weaknesses in a lot of areas that I think there are some people like, I'm real, wow. Um, 
Damn, that's a good question. I never thought of that. It's because I know that a lot of my skill set is in niche areas. There's like these little narrow fields that, mm -hmm. I, that I'm really good at, you know. And then people that recognize that will hire me, they say, hey, this is a situation that fits someone who thinks out, that thinks like this. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need people who think inside the box. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need people that think outside the box. Sometimes people who always think unorthodox and outside the box all the time can be a waste of resources and be more of a problem than an mm -hmm. asset. Mm -hmm. That sometimes is me. You know, uh, when sometimes just the regular old run of the mill of doing things is how people should actually do. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I never actually thought of that. You know, I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, even my level of critical thinking and logic isn't like a logic professor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very different. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. more applicable to a lot of everyday way of thinking and, you know, and entry level analytics of stuff. So, yeah, you couldn't give me a PhD there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I guess, hey, um, hey, I guess you could say, um, um, uh, what is that? If you look at the competitive intelligence, you give me a PhD in, uh, uh, Applied racism in the professional field of competitive intelligence. Mm. <laughs> there you go. That I am a master. That, that I am a master of. You know. Well, I've one got, more time. This is a very distinct niche title. Unamas, yeah. por favor. I mean, actually, you know, if you Google, if anyone's interested, Google competitive intelligence, and you'll see that there's an entire field in actual. There's actually even educations in that industry called competitive intelligence. Yeah. So yeah. But that type of area, yeah, it would be its own, you know, using racism to how smart folks. I mean, even se I can tell you stories of sexism outsmarting a bunch of guys in in the competitive, you know, intelligence field. You know, I I've seen women go into places and get men to tell them where all the cameras were at, who took the trash out. I mean, things that men could never have gotten the guys to tell them. You know, I've seen women just just walk right in places and walk right out, no research. You know, here I am. I'm up all night long researching everybody, researching the company. I'm standing outside the place, check it out. Women walk up through nothing, walk their ass right in there and get everything that I work so hard to try to get. And without knowing nothing, just playing to men's sexism as they walk their ass in there, you know. So, yeah, I've seen that happen too. So I've seen the isms played with people who know, you know, that's why I, hey, that's why I tell folks, hey, look, if you ever have to disappear and hide, you better hope someone doesn't hire women private investigators to get you. They will walk through every defense you have and find you. <laughs> they will walk straight through all of it. You know, there's some areas where they're just going to be way better than me. You know, for so some situations, I'll probably say, hey, you need to get some white women for that job. You know, and in some situations, it's like, hey, being white shit might, might not actually work all that well. You, know, yeah, you yeah, might yeah. actually need me, so.